Go back into public. Sorry, we'll go back into public session again. Item 11, meeting with Digital Rights Ireland on behalf of the committee. I would like to welcome T.J. McIntyre and Fergal Cregan, Cregan of the Digital Rights of Ireland. I have no doubt that you are well aware of the reasons for this engagement and that we propose to compile a report for the Houses at the end of this consultation pro process. I don't propose to read the, the defamation as has already been stated, so um, I'll ask you now to make your, your, your presentation. Thank you, uh, Chairman, um, Deputies and Senators. Um, we're very glad of the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, Digital Rights Ireland, if I can say a little bit about the group, was set up in 2005. We had a concern that uh, traditional civil liberties were well represented offline by the likes of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, but new issues were arising online that needed an additional input that perhaps wasn't there with the more traditional groups. Since then, um, we have joined with similar groups across Europe in the European Digital Rights Initiative. We have instituted a constitutional challenge against a European law which we say violates privacy, which is in fact um, very shortly going to be at hearing for the European Court of Justice. Um, and we've engaged, um, certainly with a number of the deputies here I know, um, on issues including online privacy, um, internet filtering and blocking and so on over the last number of years. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I am an um, Associate Dean of the School of Law in UCD where I specialise in information technology law issues and I'm also a practising solicitor um, working both for social media websites and also for users who feel that their rights have been violated. Um, my colleague Fergal Crean is a practising barrister. He has advised Digital Rights Ireland from the outset um, in 2005, including in our constitutional challenge before, currently before the European Court of Justice, and he is a specialist in this area also. Now, as you know, abuse of the online medium is very, very far from being a new phenomenon. What I have on the slide in front of you is the first reports that I was able to find um, of a criminal conviction for this type of behaviour. This dates back to 1999, when a man was jailed under the old criminal libel legislation in relation to spreading false allegations of sexual abuse against a teacher. And that, I think, illustrates something here, that this is very far from being a new issue, and it's an issue which is very much regulated by existing laws already. Going back to 1999, we see that where the will is there, where the resources are there to allow enforcement, we can achieve results using those existing laws. I've put a number of those laws um, there in front of you. Um, in fact, I had to hold myself back slightly to try to cram them all into one slide. We could have had two or three slides full of relevant legislation um, if, uh, if um, we wanted to bore you with all of it. But there are a couple of particular points that I'd like to make about particular aspects of that legislation, if I may. Some of it has already been canvassed before you in previous hearings. Um, some of it hasn't. In particular, um, I noticed that Deputy Ellis earlier mentioned the phenomenon of threats being made via YouTube in relation to his constituency. And in fact, there is already an existing offence which doesn't seem to be realised always. If you look at the Non-Fatal Offence Against the Person Act, there is a distinct offence in Section 5 of threats to kill or cause serious harm. So that already does constitute a crime which can be prosecuted under existing laws. Likewise. Um, we had the uh, comment um, earlier from um, Deputy Harrington, who was asking about the rights of the subjects of YouTube videos. Again, those rights are already um, amply protected by Irish data protection law. There is the general right to ensure that your information is fairly obtained and fairly processed in Section 2 of the Data Protection Act. There is a specific right which gives you the ability to object to processing of your personal data that is going to cause you distress. And that's right contained in Section 6A of the Data Protection Act. Um, again, it might be that there isn't the level of awareness of those rights that there might be. And perhaps we might need both more education of users in relation to the rights that they have and also more resources in the enforcement end in relation to those rights. Um, that also addressed the point that um, was made earlier on um, by Deputy Phelan, who mentioned the jurisdictional issue, the possibility of cross-border enforcement. One of the benefits of data protection law is that it is largely harmonised across Europe. So we already have situations where we can go to, if material is hosted in the UK, Germany, France, we can go to the local data protection regulators and we can ask them to enforce Irish citizens' rights 
which are largely the same in those jurisdictions as they would be here. So, um, to that extent, I think we already have very substantial laws in place that deal with most of these points. The final point I'd like to make there is in relation to Deputy Kenny's point earlier on about traceability. And traceability is covered, I think, in two regards here. First of all, we have the so-called Norwich Pharmacal Order that enables users to be identified by the High Court in civil actions. We also have Section 8 of the Data Protection Act which enables information to be released by, for example, YouTube, to Gardaí in relation to criminal investigations. So the tools are already there to authorise disclosure in many cases. Whether or not the awareness of those tools is uh, necessarily in place may be another matter. Chair, just a minute. Could you expand a bit on the Norwich Pharmacal Order? Um, abs absolutely, Deputy. Um, going back to 2005, an action was brought by the Irish music industry against people whom it accused of uploading music. And they obtained the IP addresses of those individuals, but they had then to link those IP addresses to particular names and addresses. What they did was use this Norwich Pharmacal Order, named after an English case from um, the 1970s, if I recall correctly. Um, they went to the High Court and they got an order from Mr Justice um, Peter Kelly requiring the ISPs, Aircom in that case, to disclose the identities of those individuals. And since then, this has very commonly been used. So, in fact, um, the, um, I counted recently the number of um, applications for Norwich Pharmacal Orders in Ireland in recent years, and there were certainly at least six or seven um, in the last three years, probably a lot more because not all of them necessarily appear um, in the media, but certainly at least six or seven that we know of. So it is already a well-established jurisdiction. Does it cost much to, to, to initiate that kind of an order? From, it, from, from an ordinary person? This can be expensive. Um, one of the problems with Irish laws is that we have an access to justice issue, and it's not unique to this area. We have a situation where the billionaire finds it very much easier to assert their rights than the average citizen, and unfortunately, we're not um, an outlier. I don't want to, as a lawyer, I don't want to stand here and say that lawyers are too expensive. Um, but perhaps lawyers, the court system generally, the technical expertise you might need to enforce your rights, collectively we are too expensive, I think, yes. So we have existing laws in place, um, and I'm a little bit concerned, therefore, that if we make changes to those laws, that we might undermine some of the uh, rights that currently exist. One example is in relation to anonymity, and there has been talk before the committee about greater identification, requiring real name registration of users and so on. And I'm sure committee members will recognise two great Irish writers who, for a number of different reasons, chose to write anonymously, Jonathan Swift and Miles Nagopoulin, a.k.a. Flann O'Brien, a.k.a. Brian O'Nolan, and many other names as well. And in each case, you do have situations where people do find it important to protect their identities online, in Brian um, Nolan's case, or Flann O'Brien's case, because of uh, his position as a civil servant, in the case of some columns written in the media by politicians who write anonymously to give them a freedom to speak with a certain candour that they mightn't otherwise have. I'm thinking in particular of the, uh, the Drapier column in the Irish Times. Um, but also others. Children, for example. Barnardo's recommend that children should be able to speak freely about issues such as parental breakup. They should be able to do that via a chat line or a forum or a blog to talk themselves through the issues, to engage with others about the issues that they face. But Bernardo's very strongly recommend that those children should never use their real names, they should never use their real identities online for fear that this might be used to persecute them in future. So I think there has to be a concern, again, that if we begin to restrict privacy online, we do have unintended consequences to vulnerable groups. Another vulnerable group, of course, um, are victims of domestic abuse. And this is a slide from the Women's Aid website, where they talk about the risks to women um, who, whose abusers um, discover what they do online. They use their online identities to track them, or they use the fact that women might be seeking help online uh, to prevent them from leaving an abusive relationship. Again, privacy is important for them. It's also important maybe in a slightly more unexpected context. This is the front page of the Ryanair European Pilots Association website. And in 2006, Ryanair brought an action against that website, looking to identify particular um, pilots who were posting anonymously, who were complaining about their working conditions, who were complaining about their terms of employment, um, and so on. And Ryanair essentially um, claimed to be 
protecting the safety of their workplace, but the High Court rejected their application. And Mr Justice T.C. Smith took the view that, if I may quote from his judgment, that this was not a bona fide application. It was a feigned exercise designed to divide those in the union, IALPA, from loyalty towards each other. And he said that it was a war of attrition towards Ryanair captains that they should be dissuaded from exercising their rights through legal battle. Again, therefore, there is this concern that if, in that case, the captains were to have been identified, that they would have been unable to gather together to collectively exercise their rights to, for example, form a union, engage in union activity, engage possibly in industrial action. And then the final example is the whistleblower example. You'll be familiar with the case of uh, Mr Noel Wardick, who was the, um, a very senior um, member of staff in the Irish Red Cross, who anonymously blogged about certain governance concerns that he had, and who was eventually identified by means of an application um, seeking his identity from Blogger, the platform operated by Google. He eventually came out publicly, identified himself. He was dismissed from the Red Cross as a result of being identified. And as you know, I, I believe he testified um, before the Oireachtas on a number of occasions concerning um, the governance situations there. Again, we have a concern here that restrictions which make it easier to identify people will again tend to deter, in this case, the whistleblower from being willing to come forward. A related point um, comes about when we think about applying existing telecoms law to the internet. Previous hearings have mentioned the offence under Section 13 of the um, Post Office Amendment Act of 1951, and that's the offence of sending abusive messages. Um, and there is a real risk that if we expand that offence further, that it might have unintended knock-on effects on what can be said online. And with the Chair's permission, I'll ask um, my colleague, uh, Mr Crehan, to address that point. Okay. Uh, good morning, Mr Chairman. Um, Section 13, uh, Mr Chairman, of the uh, Post Office Amendment Act uh, 1951 doesn't date back to 1951. It's a much more recent creation. Uh, the amendment was uh, made, most recently made in 2007. Uh, it deals with messages sent by telephone, and that in explicitly includes text messages. Messages sent by telephone that are grossly offensive or indecent or obscene or menacing, or which for the purpose of causing annoyance, inconvenience or needless anxiety uh, are sent uh, uh, persistently made uh, in the case of, of persistent nuisance telephone calls uh, and messages uh, sent that the sender knows to be false, and I suppose this would be prank calls. Um, the, the purpose uh, of this, and if, 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 if one looks at the Oireachtas record at the time the amendment was made, the purpose of this section is to deal with telephone messages which are person-to-person -person communications, and therefore any harassment that happens via person-to-person -person communication is, is by its nature far more intimate uh, than something that one perhaps stumbles across on the internet when, when searching Google. So there was a very good reason uh, that internet communications were not included within that. Um, it has been suggested that this is a section that is ripe to be expanded out uh, away from person-to-person uh, -person telecom communications uh, and into the area of, of, of internet Internet communications in general. We would have concerns about that. Uh, our first concern would be that, uh, that that question of intimacy of harassment is lost. You're now into something that is being spoken to the world at large, to nobody in particular. And uh, Deputy O'Donovan made a, a, a telling point, I think, last week, where he said that we were looking at a focus from talking to a person to talking about them. Talking to a person can, t can be harassment, it can be very aggressive. Talking about a person brings freedom of expression issues into play. Um, one of the problems that we see with expanding this offence is that it would potentially criminalise every web page, every online newspaper story, every broadcast by RTE which is placed on RTE.ie, uh, which was uh, intended to cause annoyance. Now, it is in the nature of certain kinds of political art uh, or certain kinds of political speech making that annoyance uh, is intended or provocation is intended. That would be immediately criminalised. Uh, it also creates a very subjective crime. What is grossly offensive? What is indecent? What is obscene or menacing? Um, if one looks at a forum such as, for example, politics.ie, where partisan politics are involved, uh, 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 um, tempers frequently run 
high, especially coming up to elections. There is the question of one man's vigorous debate is another man's offensive uh, or grossly offensive or indecent message. Um, and it's, it's a very subjective question. Do we allow it to judges to decide? Different judges may have different views on what is uh, grossly offensive. Um, or do, do we attempt to set some sort of a, a subjective standard based on the offence caused to the person who was offended? If we do that, we effectively allow the most easily offended people to set the standard for, for freedom of expression. Um, and finally, it would break the principle of parity between online and offline speech, which is that it would make a crime to say something online which was not a crime to say offline. Uh, there are certain things, certain uh, admittedly unsavoury things that are shouted, for example, at the terrace of a football or a hurling match. Um, you say that online, it suddenly becomes a crime, uh, and there are, there are difficulties of parity there. Finally, uh, and this I think is a, is a key practical point, it would add to the already huge workload of the Garda Computer Crime Unit. Um, these would be very, very work-intensive offences to investigate and to prosecute. Uh, they would be dumping a huge amount of very work-intensive uh, offences onto the desk of the Garda Computer Crime Unit, who, as we will see, are already significantly overworked. Um, there is a comparable English law in Britain, uh, uh, in England and Wales rather, section 127 of the Communications Act in 2003 is not limited to telephone messages in the same way this is. Uh, it has been misused and in fact the, the Crown Prosecution Service has recently issued guidelines suggesting uh, that these kind of grossly offensive type prosecutions not be pursued in the public interest, that they, there was, they felt it would lead to a debacle and that they should remove the focus back to person-to-person -person communications of a threatening nature. Uh, in any case, um, expanding Section 13, we feel, would likely be in breach of Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, there's also a freedom of expression uh, guaranteed by our Constitution, and the quote there is from the Sunday Times versus UK, a uh, European Court of Human Rights case, that points out that freedom of, inf uh, freedom of expression uh, applies to unpopular and offensive and shocking and disturbing speech, as well as to those that are uncontroversial. And indeed, there's very little point in having a right to freedom of expression if it only applies when you're saying things. Uh, that are universally popular. Um, so suggestions, we're, we're not just here to say don't do anything. We understand that there are issues with the, with the internet um, and we understand that certain actions have to be taken. What are we suggesting? Well, firstly, we're suggesting adequate funding for the Data Protection Commissioner. The, the graph in the slide before you shows the funding over recent years of the DPC and you'll see that uh, as of 2011, funding is almost back down to 2004 levels. Uh, over this time, a huge number uh, of large data holders uh, have moved into Ireland. The Data Protection Commissioner, because the likes of Google, Facebook and LinkedIn are based in Ireland, the Data Protection Commissioner is, has one of the biggest workloads of any regulator in Europe, bigger than countries many times the size of Ireland, because we uniquely have so many of these companies based here. Uh, and yet, uh, we believe they're not adequately funded. They have a staff of 20. Uh, doing the job uh, of, of regulating all of the data, for example, that Facebook hold for all of Europe. Um, they have a staff so small that they fit in a small office upstairs from a centre in Port Harlington, and yet they're regulating data for all of Europe in, in uh, companies such as, uh, as Facebook. Um, we would also suggest more funding for the Computer Crime Investigation Unit. Now, the, the slide before you is from the examiner last year, and it points out that uh, it emerged in a court proceedings recently that there is a three-year waiting list to prosecute some child pornography offences because the, uh, the resources simply aren't available to the unit. Now, to create a new offence of offensive uh, communications via internet would be to dump on this already clearly overworked unit a vast amount of low-level district court level offences that nonetheless are hugely work intensive uh, and we feel that um, uh, until we have until we have that unit adequately uh, funded to do the job that it already has uh, it would not necessarily be a good idea uh, to dump yet more very work intensive offences onto its desk um, we're uh, happy uh, to have been invited to the uh, committee today uh, and we're happy to answer any questions that the members of the committee or the chairman might have. Yeah, and thank you both now for your, your brevity and sticking within the time limit and um, to give members an opportunity uh, to ask some questions and the first member we have is Michael Meinhardt. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and, and thank you for coming before us. And I think that uh, you know your uh, presentation here this morning has been excellent, and has certainly gone into a lot of the issues that we have been exploring and the issues that we have put to the various uh, 
uh, I suppose, service providers, uh, for the want of a better word, over the last couple of weeks. Um, I suppose just in relation to something that said in the terraces or hit 16 at the football match, when it said it's finished, but when it goes up on the internet, it stays there. And I suppose that's where some of the issues are. Um, you know, you, you quoted some of the, the uh, judgments going right back to 2005, and uh, where uh, they were able to trace uh, back to IP addresses. That the, the technology is there, you know, for uh, the false information or uh, malicious information to be put up on the net. Can, that has been there for 10, 15 years at this stage, I believe. You know, it, it, it isn't a new phenomenon. And, you know, some people have said, you know, that they, in various investigations. They haven't been able to get that far, but uh, you know that's fictitious for the want of a better word. But it has been really there for 10 to 15 years at this stage. I suppose what I would say to you, um, the uh, apologies, the uh, what I would say is that in relation to, um, um, you know, the. the the cases that you have put before us and the, the legal cases and so forth, I think that there's very little knowledge out there within those who are using the uh, internet or indeed uh, from us, I think that over the last couple of weeks, we've always tried to explore, and even the Minister uh, said, and I've said it on numerous occasions, put it to every group that have come before us about the legislative gap. You know, there seems to be a whole raft of legislation out there uh, governing this. And I think that uh, we as a committee, the first thing we want to do is to uh, highlight that and to make sure people aware of what evidence that you put before us, because I think you have put, um, you know, you've put detail there before us that is. Uh, if it, it is fantastic to see it, and fantastic to see, you know, the judgments and, and the quotes that she have made in the judgments. And I think that uh, we need to highlight that um, in any way, shape, or form that we can. But um, your, again, your presentation has been excellent, and maybe you might just clarify. Uh, you know, you've spoken about maybe changing the X uh, to an, uh, an already overburdened system. But if there was one or two issues that you were handed a blank page, and you said that there is, um, I suppose, um, short-sightedness, or that there is um, some areas that could be uh, looked at to highlight and to ensure that people that are using the, uh, the whole internet are protected fully, if there were one or two things that you would like to see put into it, maybe you might enlighten us. Um, thank you, Deputy Moynihan. Um, but can I just say, I think uh, your point in relation to education is a very important one, and I think these committee hearings are a very important aspect of educating people in general about that by bringing the issue to public awareness. Now, you asked if there were any particular uh, one or two points that we could see change, what would those be? Um, the problem here is largely not one of existing laws, it's one of access to those laws and access to justice. Um, and it's important that people have mechanisms available to them which don't require them to spend several thousands of euro on a trip to the High Court for, for example, a Norwich Pharmacal Order. One of the best ways in which people can exercise um, their right is through the Data Protection Commissioner's Office, which, as we've seen, is rather underfunded. Um, the other thing I would suggest is that if we were to see one change as regards um, funding of the um, Garda Computer Crime Investigation Unit, that re investigations in this area are necessarily very often cross-border, and they're necessarily um, very often technically intensive. They can require looking at, for example, the contents of laptops, looking at technical evidence. And a problem there is that, in many cases, these aren't very complex matters that should be handled out of Harcourt Street. These are matters which, for the most part, should be handled in the local guard station level. But it's the need for that specialist expertise that imposes the bottleneck. And I think if we were to see greater funding for the Computer Crime Investigation Unit, we could help to address that particular bottleneck. But the cross-border, you know, the cross-jurisdictional and cross-border issue, you know, is there an issue there as well? You know, uh, if somebody uh, puts up, posts something uh, in China or in the UK or whatever in, in a different jurisdiction uh, to where the actual person is living, uh, what access is there and what, I, I think, what blockages are there for them to seek uh, redress? Well, Ireland has mutual legal assistance treaties mm -hmm. with a number of jurisdictions, most importantly the US, because the vast majority of these services tend to be headquartered in the US. So if something amounts to a criminal offence, it's already the case that the Computer Crime Investigation Unit could make use of that process to get information from 
for example, Google in Mountain View in California. So the mechanisms are again already in place. Um, one problem here perhaps is that Ireland has yet to ratify the Convention on Cybercrime. We entered into this convention, we um, agreed to it in 2001, uh, we intended to um, implement it and ratify it by 2003 and uh, we're still waiting. Um, and one of the advantages of doing that is it would help provide for dedicated points of contact between um, national police forces. Okay, Patrick. Uh, thanks, Chairman, and I'd like to thank the, um, the um, people for making the presentation. I suppose, first of all, I agree with everything you said in relation to accessibility to the courts, and I said it here last week, it is the preserve of the rich in the story, and I know that people will say that uh, legal fees have come down, but that's in the real world that, um, you know, that most of us deal with. The court system in Ireland for, for, for civil matters is the preserve of the rich, and you, you can't be... If you, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it, basically, to be going up to the four gold mines. And anybody that thinks they can go up there in relation to anything that we've discussed in the last fortnight, um, you would want a serious amount of cash to go up there. So for the, for the ordinary punter who is on the receiving end of some of the stuff that we're, we're discussing, um, it would appear to me that, that accessibility to the court system uh, to vindicate their name and to have their name restored is something that just is simply not available to them. From just, what I would agree with you in relation to the protection of identity, um, and, and I noticed the, the, the examples that you made in relation to Drapier and Jonathan Swift and that, but I suppose in the, at the end of the day, if Drapier said something about a member of the Oireachtas that was um, uh, defamatory or libelous, you could take a case against, for instance, the Irish Times or whatever the paper that was, 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 was printing it. And for me, there's a big difference and there's, a, there's an issue in, in relation to where does freedom of speech end and where does defamation start? And how, um, how do you actually, I suppose, um, set margins on that? For instance, we had a very high profile situation of where an anonymous tweet in some people's minds changed the outcome of an election. Now, I'm firmly of the opinion, and I know that some people wouldn't agree with me, that an anonymous tweet did, in my mind, change the outcome of a very significant election. And I suppose, where, where, where does anonymity then fit into that? If you have Mary from Dunlow um, texting in or uh, tweet, tweeting into a, a programme, uh, politically motivated, uh, and doing untold damage on an you know, absolutely a baseless um, allegation being read out on either a national or a local broadcaster, and how do you marry that freedom of speech? with the absolute untold damage that it does to someone's reputation, because then somebody says, Asher, sure, there's no smoke without fire. Um, I suppose, just in relation as well, to, I was interested in, in, in what you said in relation to the, um, the um, Convention of cyber, on Cybercrime, and I suppose just what, in, your own, in your own experiences, what do you feel is the delay in ratifying it, if it's been around since, if it's been knocking around since 2003, what do you feel is, is the delay in ratifying it? And, in relation then as well to um, uh, just in general in your experiences, if, as I, if, I, if, 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 if I'm the owner of a, a national newspaper uh, and I publish something that I haven't done the, the background checks on and that it was a story given to me by Mary, Jack, Billy, Tom and Joe and it was changed as every time it, it came along, everybody added their own 10% vet it. And by the time it came to me, the, the story was totally different. And the, court, the paper goes into court and judge hands down judgment. In your experiences, has there been any situation where, in Ireland, in the recent past, where um, some of the um, um, social media outlets or some of the discussion fora that, you're, that, that, that you mentioned, have any of them been challenged in the courts in terms of what they're allowing to be hosted? Because, as I say, if I'm the owner of a newspaper, or if I'm a news outlet, and I knowingly uh, print something, or publish something, or allow a newscaster to announce something without checking it, and without saying you know, that there's any element of truth in this, uh, I have a vicarious liability straight away that you know, I'm going to take a hit on this as well, and uh, you know, I'm going to wind up paying the piper here. In your experiences, has any of these so-called fora um, been subjected to the same sort of uh, treatment? In fact, I think the answer to that is yes, and not only is that, uh, that the case, it's uh, that they are constantly under threat of legal action. 
um, and very often actually subjected to legal action. Um, the moderators of boards.ie recently posted a picture of a whiteboard on which they had written, it is now five hours since we received a threat of High Court action. Um, and it's the experience certainly of forums such as boards.ie, politics.ie and the others that both threats are made on a regular basis and indeed um, you will see from the High Court records that cases are filed against um, Irish social, social networking sites on quite a regular basis. The would, the, sorry, the, chair, would the bulk of them be settled or would they be? Um, the majority of cases would be settled. Um, the number of cases which have gone to judgment um, is very, very limited. Um, and in fact, the one Irish written judgment on the point is a case called Mulvaney and Betfair, which involved allegations against Betfair regarding comments that a user made in uh, the, their chat forum. The Betfair case actually illustrates maybe the answer to your second question, which was, what is the liability in these situations? The liability in these situations is governed by the e-commerce directive. And that provides for so-called hosting liability. If you host comments that a user makes, if you're a social networking site, you host their comments, you're not liable for the comments until you've been notified of them and given an opportunity to take them down. And if at that stage you're notified that these comments are defamatory or they're um, uh, in breach of the criminal law or they're in contempt of court and you fail to take them down at that point, then at that point you face liability. And that aims to strike a balance between avoiding the need to pre-moderate the, for example, many hours of content uploaded to YouTube every second, um, but while at the same time allowing an individual whose rights have been infringed to seek redress. And just in relation to the anonymity then, like where does freedom of speech end in your mind and where does defamation and all the rest of it start? Well, where the law stands at the moment, I think, is a good point. And that is to say that you enjoy a presumptive right to anonymity. It's a right that can be taken away from you by the High Court in civil action if a good case is shown against you. Not just an allegation, but a reasonably substantive case is made against you. It's a right that can be lost in the context of criminal proceedings where the Guardi have reasonable suspicion to investigate a possible crime. And that, I think, is not something... Doesn't that prove the point that I made in, at the outset in relation to you know, younger people, especially and people who don't have access to uh, our, our people in schools or whatnot? Uh, that proves the point that it really is not something that's accessible. So, Certainly in, in a civil context, I'd say no, it's not, it's not accessible. It's not accessible, no. Okay. Um, did, did no, just thank you for the presentation. Um, and I, I, I know that you say that you, you have to protect uh, traditional rights online as well as offline. And do you feel the sort of that there, there are any laws that are missing in regards to this? You know, I mean, you've mentioned different areas um, where, where there is a lot of protections. But is there any areas that you could, you could tell us where you feel that there's, we're missing um, in terms of what we're, you know, trying to protect people? Um, I also want to ask in regards to the, you know, if someone is using, whether it's a computer or a handphone or anything like that, um, is there any powers in, in terms of seizing those, if you can identify them, what the, what the powers are like in, in terms of, um, do, do, do you believe that, they, that that should be a mechanism to, you know, if you can't get at the person and you can seize the equipment, is that acceptable or is there, is there anomalies there in the law that would stop that? In, in terms of phone calls and, and sort of uh, the monitoring of phone calls, I know in the past there was often words triggered off, um, whether they were... Uh, where they were offensive words or there were words that um, um, were used by certain certain groups to trig they trigger off um, uh, no I'm just I'm just uh, I just want to you know they were used by overseas intelligence um, networks in terms of identifying uh, particular words um, and and do you have a, an, an opinion in relation to uh, is that acceptable? Uh, you know, do, is, do you find that there's no problem that uh, people should be able to monitor um, phone calls in, in, a, in a similar way? I was going to talk about Twitter because I just think the, the whole issue with a quick message um, and when it comes up online, sometimes it comes up and I think some stations have a slight delay so they can mon monitor it. Um, before they put it up, um, is that the normal process, or is it 
you know, do you, do you have an opinion as to whether that should come up straight away without being interfered with? Uh, I just want, wanted to hear your, your thing. Um, the, data, the Data Protection Commissioner, um, obviously th there certainly um, needs to be more done in regards to that. It seems to be very underfunded, and we do need um, more, more, you know, uh, you know, more monitoring in terms of is, is things, you know, being monitored properly, you know, and just if you could, if you could tell us what you think should be done in that area in, in terms of funding that, you know, for the Commissioner uh, and put more funding, where that would go and what it would do. Okay, Deputy Fiala. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and um, thank you, TJ and Fergal, for a, a very um, detailed presentation. And I suppose it seems to me, from an overall point of view, is that yes, there is lots of legislation there. Where we seem to fall down is on the um, the enforcement seems to be lacking. But as we did discuss, the, the volume of of traffic on these uh, social networks is um, is so huge that the mind boggles even at uh, how you begin to um, trawl through um, uh, the amount of stuff that's there. But I wanted to expand Patrick's point a little bit um, about. In law, you can always deal with the very serious crime because all the laws are there to, to do with that and the Gardaí will get involved because the nature of the crime is very serious. The most difficult crime to deal with is the low-level nuisance type crime that is not enough to go after but still causes people the most amount of um, discomfort because if you have a serious crime somebody more than likely ends up in jail because of it but and that's what I'm talking about on the social networks as well there's a lot of low level nuisance type stuff that nobody is really too bothered about going after because it's going to take up too much time it's going to take up too much money you're not going to clog the court with um, what you see but it still remains to be very abusive and bullying in nature. And to plug that gap between the very serious stuff and the nuisance type stuff, um, what would you think of setting up um, something similar, similar to the Press Council um, to do with social media, where somebody could take their case to um, a concentrated area like that, have their case looked at without having to go into the realms of, you know, defamation and trying to get all, you know, through the courts and everything like that. Thank you. Okay, and finally, Deputy Noel Hart. <coughs> Thanks very much, Chair. I think, I think, the, I think the first thing we should we should really focus on again is is one of the reasons why we these these hearings have taken place was to deal with cyberbullying and the dangerous effects on those most vulnerable um, from from online abuse or online bullying. Um, the, our very first presentation was from the minister, and, and he clearly I, re, I recall saying that he believed or he mentioned that there could be a gap in the legislation with, in this regard from the from the section that Mr. Uh, Crahan was, uh, was referring to under the Post Office Act. Um, since the hearings, I, I'm, I'm convinced I don't think there is a gap in the legislation, I'll be quite honest, or a significant gap or one that we should be looking at. I think the, the issues, it's not access to, you know, again, every, almost everyone that presented said that what, what, what's illegal offline is similarly illegal online. Um, but getting to a position where you can deal with that is, is, is the difficulty. And each of the different platforms and each of the different companies that we listen to have different ways of doing it, different ways of reporting. Some use anonymous uh, users, some uh, Facebook, for example, you have to be identified, you have to be named um, to, 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 be, to, to go online and, and to take part in that traffic. But um, one, of the, one of the questions I have, and if, if you focus on why we come back here. We talk a lot about people being defamed or people being, you know, illegal use, illegal online use. Quite often, those that are the subject of that type of, of, of abuse are well able to defend themselves in many cases. There are politicians, there are business people, they're in the public eye, they're journalists, they're, they're people that are on, online quite a lot. They generally have, they're well educated, they have access to the courts and they know how to do what we have, what we have a problem with, is, for, is those people that suffer abuse, that do not have the resources to go to the high court, don't even know how to 
in many cases, to even report abuse uh, uh, online. Um, what I would I, I'd ask, you know, as part of your suggestions, uh, Mr. McIntyre suggested the uh, greater funding to the, the, the Data Protection Office, which I, I, I think, in, in terms of having Google and Facebook and, and all the rest of it as the European headquarters here, is, is, is an absolute must, in my opinion. I think we have I think we have to do it because the economic benefit that they provide to this country would, would, is, is vastly superior to the potential cost that we would to to to, 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 to rebalance that. But I, I, I would say, is there any role, for example, in creating some platform or some, I suppose, connect, connection that would allow people at the very lowest end, I'm, ta I'm talking about no people at school, teenagers, I'm talking about people who, who, the vulnerable who will take this and become very distressed by what they might read online to the point where they become, you know, we've, we've, we've all read about the recent cases that there would be um, some way of establishing a, a, a kind of a, um, I suppose, a, a, a group or an association. Like, I, we've, we've listened to the, the Office for Internet Safety, for example, and nobody seems to have heard of them. And they're under the, the aegis of the Department of Justice. I'm very disappointed that they haven't at their role in, in all of this. And I don't think their role fits this. I can't see any role anywhere else. Would, would, would you support the idea of setting up something at that very low level? to protect what the most vulnerable, like I said, after, after listening to the entire debate, they are still the ones that are going to get caught out, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and can I just follow up there in relation to the gap in the legislation? You seem to imply that um, digital rights refer to Section 13 yeah. of the Post Office Amendment, whereas uh, Minister Rabbit, uh, in his presentation, said that the Communication Re Regulation Amendment Act 2007 was the 2007 Act amended the 1953 Act. It has a very convoluted history, oh, uh, right. that Post Office Act. But it's the same thing. But it is the same section okay. we're referring to. Yeah, yeah. I just want a clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can you take the three questions? Okay, okay. Um, I might address, first of all, a couple of those points. Um, in relation to going backwards, um, Deputy Harrington's point, um, how do you protect those people who don't have the resources, for example, to bring a high court action? One of the... Um, approaches that might be used as a model is the approach taken in the United Kingdom, where they have a, safe, a safer internet centre, which is really just an informational resource, but it allows people a one-stop shop to go there and say, I have been abused online, I have um, been bullied, etc. And it then provides them with guidance as to how they can access the remedies that might be available. Um, it might, for example, show them how you can use a block function. It might show them how you can effectively use a reporting function on systems such as Facebook. Um, and to my mind, if you were to see the Office for Internet Safety develop a role, I'd like to see it move towards that particular model. And I think Deputy Harrington's point also overlaps somewhat with the point made by Deputy Phelan regarding this being um, an area of rather low-level um, crime. And I think it's important, that's an important point in the sense that we're possibly misleading ourselves here by our focus on criminal prosecutions, the role of um, international borders. Um, very often we're talking about what well, is really just localised bullying. There isn't necessarily an international dimension here. In fact, there isn't necessarily even a criminal dimension here because many of the cases we're talking about are those cases that involve children. And it is very unlikely, as a practical matter, that juveniles are going to ever be prosecuted for even criminal offences they might commit in this context. And I think most of us um, wouldn't want to see, as parents, for example, we wouldn't want to see children get a criminal record in respect of ill-judged tweets they might have made um, one night. So. Possibly, to maybe um, from a point of view of our focus, we might be better served focusing more on the, the concrete examples of abuse rather than on the, some of the hypotheticals which don't necessarily arise. But also in relation to Deputy Phelan's point, she asked, is there um, a case to be made for a social media press council, if you like? Um, and I suppose the answer to that is we already have such a thing in the individual um, complaints resolution systems that are set up within the likes of Facebook, boards.ie, YouTube and so on. They all, if you like, operate their own complaints resolution service. Now, I can see the merit in suggesting that there should be a one-stop shop, but to my mind, a one-stop shop would 
uh, threaten the diversity that's very important here. Because ultimately we're talking about different online communities where you have different standards. Some of these communities are very family friendly and they enforce certain standards for identity. Facebook, for example. Some of them are much more open and freewheeling and they allow you to be anonymous. Twitter, for example. Some of them are uh, much more vitriolic and I dare say politics.ie is in that category. And we don't want to have a one-size-fits-all solution that would um, in effect try to impose a single set of standards on all these disparate organisations. So possibly to that extent the UK Safer Internet Centre might be more useful as if you like a front end to those individual complaints um, resolution mechanisms rather than having a single a separate body which would adjudicate um, on complaints regarding all these um, different communities because I think ultimately the governance of each individual internet community should, in the first instance, if it doesn't break the law, it should be a matter for that community itself. Um, the uh, Deputy Ellis also made a point regarding prior filtering or monitoring by analogy with the practice that went on in England for many years and made for all we know, go on to date, of monitoring all phone calls from Ireland and looking for certain suspicious keywords. Um, this is something that's actually governed by European law. The e-commerce directive, Article 15, provides that we may not impose a general duty to monitor on internet service providers. And that means that the law may not, for example, require the likes of YouTube to pre-moderate every video before it goes up or to implement, for example, a keyword filtering system before a video goes live. Now that said, there's nothing to stop an individual provider choosing to do that if they wish. So um, Facebook, for example, um, would certainly be entitled to monitor public posts for bad language if they wished and block those posts. But again, I'd suggest that this is really a matter for the community norms within each um, organisation rather than a matter for a one-size-fits-all legislative solution. And I think uh, Fergal was going to address the remaining points. Uh, yes, to just uh, firstly to, to, to address, uh, TJ has mentioned already the question of is there a gap in the legislation. I, I think we need to ask, are some of these problems problems that can be fixed by legislation? Uh, and we talk in particular about uh, the alleged lack of legislation to deal with bullying. But if we look at classic occasion of bullying is where a child gets beaten up and has their lunch money stolen. Now in the adult world we call that a mugging and people get sent to jail for it and we have to ask ourselves is that how we want to deal with bullying? Are there legal remedies to bullying or is it something that has to be dealt with on a much lower more educational level and, and I would say that it is. So sure there are laws there to deal with that kind of thing but it may not necessarily be a good idea to get the law involved. Um, I, I think some kind of educational program is necessary. We have ads on TV for Drink Aware, we have ads on TV for Safe Food um, and various other kind of public health issues. I would say that this is a public health issue insofar as when children go to school they learn to read and write of course but they also learn how to play with other children, how to get on with people their own age or different ages, how to respect people who are different from them and so on. That's what they learn in the playground, that's what they learn outside of the classroom. Increasingly, children and adults live their life online, and perhaps there is scope for that, uh, not only from, a, from just a general socialising, learn to play with your peers point of view, but from a civic point of view, if we're to have some kind of a civic education where debate and public debate is, is polite and reasonable, then that may be something to be looked at on an educational level. Um, uh, there was the question raised by Deputy uh, O'Donovan regarding, uh, and also by Deputy Ellis, regarding uh, 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 tweets and text messages sent into radio and the, the famous occasion of the presidential debate and so on. Um, in my experience, in, certainly in a radio station, the presenter will have a, have a computer in front of him or her and will read whatever he seems to think is interesting and will contribute to the programme. So he is acting as a, he is acting in a journalistic role. There, there's no filtering going on except that he or she decides, that's a funny tweet I'll read out, that's an interesting text, I'll read that out. In the event that something defamatory is read out, um, it will be that journalist and that radio station's neck on the line. Now, if they wish to go after the person who sent the tweet or the text, it may not be financially worth their while, but if they wish to do that, they are free to do so and they can join them uh, as parties to the dispute. But there's no question of filtering there. Broadcasters decide what they want to read out in the same way as newspapers. And again, Deputy O'Donovan referred to the stories that often uh, snowball with quotes from various different parties. Everyone has their 10% added. At the end of the day, a journalist 
uh, and an editor has to decide whether their sources are credible or not. And if, if your source is only a tweet, then it may not be a good idea to go to print. I think that there's a distinction, though, and, and to be fair about it, a journalist will not print in, 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 a, in a newspaper, and from Kilkenny, Sid, or a journalist from a newspaper will not will not uh, will not will not print, um, you know, um, uh, tea, uh, just a nickname. They won't print that. So at the end of the day, what has what has happened in, in in I believe, not only in the instance of the presidential election but in other cases as well, is that somebody's listening to this at home, sitting down eating their breakfast, and a text comes in. Probably, not probably, definitely politically motivated to do damage. It's read out, and then, you know, the, the press office or the individual concerned who has been defamed or had damaged until them rings in. There's absolutely nothing you can do then. It is almost like the person. It, it, it is. It's like going out into the middle of a field with a bag of feathers, letting them loose, and then going around and asking to collect them. You can't. If, if something is defamatory, you sue the broadcaster, and you'll, yeah, get, on, you'll get on an awful lot better suing the broadcaster than I think, trying to track down the Yeah, but I think through the chair, Mr. Crean, you said that, that, that the same was um, applicable to the print media or to the, to the broadcast media. You will never have an RT or a BBC or a news bulletin or an article in a newspaper with uh, Noel from Beira said... You'll have, you know, if, if Noel from Beira and Noel Harrington, that's the way it'll be published. It won't be Noel from Beira and there happens to be 40 Noels from Beira yeah. and you can't identify which one of them is which. Well, I, I can think of specific instances where phone in shows uh, uh, led, to, led to defamation claims, uh, even, with, that's the point even, with, even with the delays. And this was pre-internet, where phone in shows led to radio stations being sued for what they allowed to be said on the air by people who called into the station. Yeah. Uh, I think um, Mr McIntyre has something to say to that. If I can just elaborate on that point. What you're describing there is um, really um, something that relates to a heavily regulated media. So it's um, a media that is already subject to obligations, be it to the press council in the case of newspapers or to the, um, the broadcasting authorities in the case of the um, broadcast media. Um, and I think it's striking you make that example because it illustrates that you are occasionally going to get abuses even in a very heavily regulated environment. Um, and I think that's not necessarily an argument for extending regulation to a different context, particularly because the um, editorial um, involvement and the editorial endorsement are very different in each case. So you mentioned, for example, the Irish Times. Um, the Irish Times, in effect, stands over what it publishes. The Irish Times brand is for a certain level of integrity and truth, truthfulness in the content of the article that it prints. It's not open to the Irish Times to say, we don't, we don't, uh, we're not willing to stand over what John Waters said today. I think it would be very um, misleading possibly to extend that analogy to the case of the internet where we don't expect Twitter or Facebook or YouTube to stand over everything that their users say. The idea that we should take a principle that has developed in the context of media which select who they will print um, and the editorial line they will take and so on and then apply that to providers who really are just conduits for the opinions of other people. Um, that's the point I'm making. The point, I, the point I'm making is where that information is being relayed onwards through another medium, uh, almost always the broadcast, either television or radio. And uh, you know, whatever person wants to tweet themselves is up, entirely up to them, and I totally accept that. It's where that information, either by SMS, text message, or by tweet, is being then relayed on through a broadcast medium. It would never be allowed in a print medium. And the reason it would never be allowed in a print medium is because you can't substantiate it. And no self-respecting journalist in a print outlet is going to do that. So the question that I have, why is that acceptable then in a broadcast outlet? Possibly, um, I think you're entirely right in, in saying that, but possibly the complaint here is not necessarily a complaint about um, the internet or Twitter, it's a complaint about yes. standards in absolutely. broadcast yeah, media. Absolutely. And um, I'm reluctant to say anything about the particular case of the presidential election because I understand litigation is still pending um, in relation to that. But I'd say more generally that the answer is this, that if a broadcaster lends its endorsement and lends its credibility to a particular tweet, then that's a much more serious matter. Because as an individual, I'm entitled to discount what I read from some random um, Twitterer, whereas I'll give it more credibility if it comes from RTE. But I think in that case, we have to think about looking more towards RTE than we do towards Twitter. I would say that in certain 
certainly in, in the question of defamation law, if you rebroadcast or republish a tweet, those words are your own and, and you can be pursued you can be pursued through the courts. There is that remedy. Obviously understanding the point you raised earlier on about access to justice and the costliness of it. But if a broadcaster uh, uh, reads out a text or a tweet on air, those words are now the broadcaster's own and they will be liable for them. Just ask in regards okay, to that, brief question. just briefly, because some, some broadcasters read out the tweets, others come up on screen, and is there any difference in terms of the law in dealing with that? Because you often see them flashing across the screen, and I always believed they were, there was a delayed reaction, uh, uh, you know, time period where someone monitored that. So the broadcaster himself, it, is he responsible as well as the background staff? That's, it's the, the broadcaster, in its corporate sense, uh, is responsible, and therefore all of its staff are responsible. Whether it is the whether it is the man or woman in front of the camera, or whether it is somebody backstage who decides what appears and what doesn't, is kind of irrelevant because it's the company, uh, uh, the, the corporate entity, that ultimately will be responsible. It is a good idea if they filter these things. If they don't filter them, they, they may face the consequences. If I okay. Can I thank both Mr McIntyre and Mr Crane for coming before us. It has certainly helped us in our deliberation with our committee work. And indeed, that brings us, I think, to the end of the public sessions um, for the last three weeks, well, the last month or more that we have been going through and getting different people in. So I want to thank the members in particular for their, their patience and indeed the, our secretariat here for um, all the hard work they put into it. I have no doubt we have come a long ways in that, that length of time in relation to educating ourselves. But I think at the end of the day, uh, when we get the report together, I think there will be a lot of useful information in it. And we've got so many viewpoints from, from across the uh, people interested. I think certainly it will be beneficial to people using it. But I think in particular after today and other days, the parents that have, that have we have we've to educate and we, we, that we've found out a lot of information, but we have to accumulate all that together, put it in, 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 um, in a report form and present it to government. So we will thank you for coming here with us today and helping us in our deliberation. Again, thank you all very much. Um, as there no other business, I declare that the meeting is to, uh, adjourned until the Thursday 21st of March at 10am. Thank you very much.